the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining this Mishcon Academy session, part of a series of online events, videos and podcasts looking at the biggest issues facing businesses and individuals today. I am Hazel Braden and I will be hosting today's session. Today we're joined by James O'Brien to discuss his new book, How They Broke Britain. For those of you who don't already know, James is a renowned journalist and broadcaster, best known for his work with LBC, where he has a daily radio news programme, which is incredibly popular for, and has a large following for its focus on current affairs, politics and social issues. So just to talk about your, your book, you've described this as a charge sheet in which you have held to account 10 different individuals who you say have broken Britain. Mm. What do you mean by charge sheet and what's the premise of the book? Well, I, I look at really extraordinary things that, are, that have happened in relatively recent years. Uh, I, I, some of them are obvious. And, and the question of how, how have we created or how have we ended up in a place where these extraordinary things could happen? So most obviously, I suppose, becoming the first population in, in human history to, to vote to impose economic sanctions on itself was a very odd thing to happen. And, and it gets odder the further we move away from the referendum. But then, you know, how on earth could Boris Johnson become prime minister? How, how could somebody as serially and obviously dishonest as Boris Johnson rise to the highest office in the land? And I thought that was a zinger of a question when the book got commissioned. But by the time it was finished, I also had to ask, how on earth could Liz Truss become <laughs> prime minister? Um, and inflict upon us the, the, the economic catastrophe that she did. And, and then there are, there are smaller questions, like how could uh, Nadine Dorries or Jacob Rees-Mogg end up in the cabinet? Just a sort of so a succession of, of events that in isolation would, would have been unbelievable as recently as, as 2015. I identify three engines of change, if you like, that, that have brought this about. I mean, I'm, I'm also thinking about a breakdown in, in objective truth, e even this week. You have Rishi Sunak posting on social media saying everybody said that we'd never be able to bring inflation down. And it's been community noted by, by users of social media and they've had to carry an actual correction. So the prime minister being corrected because nobody said that they wouldn't bring inflation down. Everybody said inflation is going to come down anyway. Whatever you do, but the, but the ease and the casualness with which that sort of dishonesty has entered public discourse. Anyone who thought it was going to end when Boris Johnson left Downing Street has been deeply disappointed. So the three engines of change that have created uh, an ecosystem in which all of these things could happen, including uh, Kwasi Kwarteng's fiscal event, um, are mostly obvious, particularly toxic right-wing media. Well, one of the reasons why we don't have a Fox News in this country, despite the best efforts of some people latterly to set one up, is because our newspapers occupy that space and have done for years. We, we just haven't really noticed because we're constantly exposed to it. But the toxicity of the Daily Mail and the latterly the Daily Telegraph and the Murdoch Empire has, has created an environment in which truth has been compromised and in which division has been commoditized. Um, and that, do you think that will change with Rupert Murdoch handing over the reins and Paul Dacre, he's 74, at some point he may retire? No. Um, <laughs> I, I, well, the business of newspaper editing now is, is managing decline, really. So I think the newspapers will wither and their readership will die off and there won't be a new generation of readers coming up to replace them. But I don't think they'll depart from the bit. It's a business model. And, and, and you know, David Yellen, a former editor of The Sun, talks to me in the book about when Roger Ailes arrived at Fox News, he's, he's kind of the, well, you, you know who he is, they got ahead of the internet. They realized that the internet was going to change the nature of hatred in the public space in such a profound way that in order for traditional media to survive, they had to go further faster. So in many ways, Fox News becomes the original troll. And, and it, it was an actual business model. And it was the point probably at which Rupert Murdoch, the boy who had ink in his blood, the, the son of a newspaper, the newspaper man, son of a newspaper man. Uh, he, 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 the last sort of vestiges of that part of him disappeared at that point, and he and he went all in on the on the, the Fox News model of media, which I think his son, and how I think you, his son will continue. How do you think GB News fits into this? 
That's a good question, and I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. They're, they're hemorrhaging about £30 million a year at the moment, and they have to consider that they're getting something worthwhile in return. So you look at who, 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 who funds it mostly, and it leads into the, one of the, the, the other engines of change, the sort of sinister network of lobby groups, secretly funded lobby groups that call themselves think tanks, but, but we'll get on to that. So that, one of the funders has a background or... or uh, is invested in that world. The other one, as far as I can tell, is just furious because his son got cancelled as the banjo player in Mumford and Son. <laughs> and he's decided to set up media organisations um, in which he can be, I don't know, rehabilitated or, or, or resurrected. But they're getting something for £30 million a year. All I can see that they're getting in return for this epic outlay is um, a, a sort of finger on the windpipe, fingers on the windpipe of the Tory party, so that if they decide to lurch further to the right in the event of losing the next general election, then GB News will become almost their propaganda arm. It will become almost the, the media arm of the, of the lunatic fringe of the lunatic fringe yeah. of the Tory party, who could, end up, who could end up in charge. Do you think the media should be held to, to account more? There should be greater regulation of what editors and journalists say and do? <sighs> Regulation is tricky. Yourself. Uh, yes, regulation is tricky. But I think, and, and in, in my younger days, I would have been furiously opposed to it. But I, 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 look, with great power comes great responsibility, and they don't show any. We don't realise how corrupted and how awful it's become uh, because we're stuck in the middle of it. And I would be part of the problem if I hadn't had this weird career change and ended up on the radio speaking every day to the results of the indoctrination and to the results of, of the media. So, yes, there should be Ofcom style regulation of reality. You, you shouldn't be able to publish blatant lies, either as opinion or worse, as news. And you're not just critical of the right-wing media, you're no. also very critical of the BBC. You say that it's been hollowed out, it ties itself up in knots trying to be impartial, and that it's actually failing as a broadcaster. Well, it must be, mustn't it? Because of what we are living through. If you've got a Prime Minister who thinks he can lie publicly uh, to, to the population about something as simple as words that he claims were said a year ago, then, then, the, then the national broadcaster has in some sense failed. I love the BBC. I cherish it. I speak as a, uh, uh, someone who, you know, in the words of Joni Mitchell, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And if, if we were to lose the BBC, we would be in 10 different types of trouble compared to what we're in now. Do you remember, you probably don't, it feels like a fever dream when all of the usual suspects were insisting that we didn't need any trade deals when we left the European Union, we'd be absolutely fine under WTO rules. Do you remember that? Let's go, WTO, said all the people who had no idea whatsoever what they were talking We don't need any trade deals. I looked into it. I think, briefly, Mauritania was a country that had no trade agreements in place. Um, that's it. That's the only country that's ever even tried it. And I don't think that was through choice. It was a civil war or something horrible like that. So they come in. Someone comes into the production office, one of the producers. And so we, we, I want to do something on the World Trade Organization. We've got to. Everyone needs to know what it is. And they come up, Pascal Lamy's in town. Pascal Lamy, former director general of the World Trade Organization. So I said, that's fantastic. Let's, is he, can he come in? He said, yeah, we can get him. He'll come on. I said, how long have we got on the program? He said, 10 minutes, probably 12, if we drop the weather. I said, drop the weather. <laughs> no one cares about it. It's always weather. raining. Yes, exactly. It's <laughs> raining. And, and Pascal Lamy will come in. And, and, and so, so we start you know, coming up with the questions we're going to ask and we need to find out what this is. And, and then obviously the editor says, well, we, we will need another guest as well. Uh, and I said, why? Said, balance. Well, balance. We'll need, and I said, but we're talking to the former director general of the World Trade Organization about the World Trade Organization. How do you balance that? <laughs> well, you just get someone to come on and say, no, you're not. <laughs> 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 or, or you don't know what you're talking about. You only used to run the place. And, and I, I wasn't a big enough beast by any stretch of the imagination to make a stand on this. I just went along with it. And, and I said, OK, so who, who are we getting on? Who are we getting on to debate the former director general of the World Trade Organization about the role, purpose, and function of the World Trade Organization? Andrea Ledson. <laughs> Andrea Ledson. Absolutely extraordinary. So I'm sitting in this kind of scenario. Pascal is a brilliant man, articulate, intelligent, compassionate, uh, sympathetic to, 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 to our plight after Brexit. Explains in great detail, but very easy to understand. Nice, comprehensible language of quite complicated themes, and, 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 and it's brilliant. And, um, and I, I end, you know, I have to go like this. I have to go, Pascal, thank you so much. <laughs> Andrea. <laughs> 
you disagree. <laughs> it's insane. I mean, it, it is actually insane and it's completely normal. But it's presented to viewers of the BBC yeah. as if they are equal and opposite forces and authorities on a subject about which one person knows everything and the other person knows nothing. Is there a way to fix the BBC? Uh, yes. About the next theme I mean, of the it's book? Not, not that long ago. Things weren't that abnormal. In, in, in the context of the BBC, they just, need to, they just need to grow a pair. And it's easier said than done, because it is frightening. And if you're off air, you are even more frightened of having... You know, they always mention how much your house is worth. I, I, you know, it, it, well, probably in this room it'll sound like um, peanuts, but you're one and a, you're one and a half million pound house in Chiswick. And, and if you're a manager at the BBC, you, you, you probably haven't been on screen ever or, or for 20 years. You don't want that. You, they're frightened of all of that, so, so they do these things. They, they try to appease organisations which, in the case of the Mail and the Murdoch Empire, are dedicated to the destruction of the BBC, not just the dilution of it or the castration of it. They're dedicated to the destruction. They hate it. And they hate it partly because it, it, well, it, it allows people to access, ideally, truth as opposed to very deliberately slanted reporting of the same stories. And they hate it because there's no money in it for them. So they're opposed to it both ideologically and commercially. And you dedicated your book to your dad. Mm. And also you put a great quote from Noam Chomsky in there. Who else has inspired you? Blimey. <laughs> um, I, I like people who... I like people who don't seem to be in it for themselves. So in public life, that's quite rare. I've found myself thinking quite a lot about Gordon Brown recently. I, I, I think there's a pivot. I don't know if you saw the former prime ministers lined up at the Cenotaph recently. And the pivot that David Cameron represents is objectively extraordinary. So it goes, it goes Major Blair Brown. And, and you could resurrect Margaret Thatcher for the purposes of this. Um, idea. Margaret Thatcher, John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, okay? Regardless of what you think about their politics, they are giants, political giants, statesmen and women of the, the, first, the highest order, okay? And you have David Cameron as the pivot point. And after David Cameron come Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak. I find that extraordinary. I, I find that that segue from statesmen and women to charlatans, liars, and idiots. Ab ab absolutely extraordinary. So I admire Gordon Brown because if someone had asked him why he wanted to be prime minister, he would have probably given you a 500-page thesis on all the things that he wanted to do. Some of them may have been implausible, some of them may have been bonkers, but the idea of Gordon Brown saying, oh, I think I'd be rather good at it, is just so utterly, utterly alien that, that I'd, I'd, I'd cite him. Um, there's journalists, I re I, Ian Hislop does an incredible job at Private Eye of, of, of keeping the truth out there when it's a, a fairly unfashionable time to be doing it. There's lots of, lots of people I admire, but in, term, I mean, in, in terms of inspiration, mm -hmm. then it's, it's people, who, it's people who, who aren't in it for themselves. And, and so that, that in politics, in recent politics, in living memory, it would be Gordon Brown, I suppose. And before I move to questions, because there's going to be quite a lot, I have to ask an incredibly cheesy question, so I apologise in advance. How do we fix Britain? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I don't think it's as far away as I did when I started writing the book. And although I don't make this point in the book, it's something that I've worked out answering this question while promoting the book. Um, Amber Rudd. All right? Amber Rudd resigned twice from the cabinet less than five years ago, or, or, or around that mark. The first time she resigned was because of individual ministerial responsibility. She had inadvertently misled the House of Commons as a result of being given doff information about something that happened when Theresa May was Home Secretary, but she bit the bullet. She did the right thing. You know, within months, Boris Johnson's advisor, independent advisor on ministerial standards, was resigning in shock and horror because he didn't sack Priti Patel after the investigation found her to be a bully. But Amber Rudd resigned the first time on that point of principle. And on the second time, she resigned as business secretary and resigned the whip over Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings culling the Tory party of any MP prepared to stand up and tell the truth about what was happening with regard to, to, to Brexit. And that is not 20 years ago. 
That's not 100 years ago. You know, that's, that's four or five years ago. So the journey back to a semblance of normality, a lot of the problems, a lot of the contributing factors to the creation of the ecosystem were there. But the aligning of the planets that happened with the madness of Brexit, the, the, the rampaging racism that was deployed to propel it, and then the, the, the character of someone like Boris Johnson or, or, or Jeremy Corbyn, the way that these planets just aligned to create the worst possible scenarios, um, that's just unlucky. And, and we're not that far away from politicians who've been caught with their fingers in the till being handed out of office, or politicians who've accidentally made mistakes resigning of their own volition, or politicians who are just disgusted by what their own party leader is doing, standing up and saying so and resigning. Or, you know that old line about all it takes for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And so the answer to your question, although it's a little bit glib, is for good people to start doing something again. I think you've you've spoken at length about the damage that the Conservative Party and the right wing media have done to the country and the proper governance and, and honesty. Um, in the interest of balance, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about um, what the left wing politics and, and media have done to, to the country and, and the proper governance. Yeah, um, I, I might have to consult Andrea Ledson before I answer that question. <laughs> I, I don't think there is. I, I, I mean, from 2010 to 2015, the Labour Party was sensible and, and moving in the right direction. From 2015 to 2019, it was a fever dream. It was absolutely bonkers. And since 2019, I think Keir Starmer's doing a fairly decent job of carrying a Ming vase across an ice rink. Um, but I don't think there is a left-wing media in this country to speak of. I, 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 not in anything like the way that balance would allow, you'd, you'd think immediately of The Guardian and, and The Daily Mirror. The Guardian is in so much danger of disappearing up its own fundament that it's, it's, it's lost any real claim to representing voters. Um, and, and The Daily Mirror is now owned by the same people that own The Daily Express, so it's a sort of an odd exercise. It's still you know, a left-wing newspaper, but it's not crusading or campaigning or commercially very successful. So I know this isn't really the answer to your question, but I think it's an illuminating question to ask, because if I asked you now, if you think about the bogus victimhood that is constantly being fed to us by right-wing media, the, the idea of the woke mob, or the tofu-eating woke karate, or the new elite, or um, the anti-growth coalition, this idea that they are the benighted minority, you know, that they are the people under constant siege from incredibly powerful institutions and individuals, it's utterly backwards, because if I asked you now to make a list of people in this country who have a significant media platform and use it to promote and pursue essentially liberal or centre-left ideas, make that list now. Yeah, well, Andrew had to leave the BBC to do that, so that means for the 30 or 40 years he, he, he wasn't doing that at all, and he is now, latterly, but that's pretty much it. You're not allowed Carol Vorderman and Gary Lineker because they only do it on Twitter. And yet to read the papers, to read the books that they write, you'd think there were millions of us, literally millions. And I can't think of three. So that's the left-wing media. And that's the problem. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.